Okay, welcome to conference numero quattro. Number four. <laughs> That's number four. Number for all four. you English speakers out there. <laughs> I'm Ben. And I'm John. Welcome back. Okay, I, th I think we should just jump right into it. Let's do it. I'm excited. Okay, so this was our first case for conference number four. It's case number 13. It's a 31-year-old male that presented with weakness, and he had been vomiting for several days. What do you think? Yeah, so I think that this looks like a normal sinus rhythm at a rate of about 75. Uh, the PR and the QRS intervals both look good, but there does seem to be a long or prolonged QT segment here. Um, definitely looks wider or longer than the R to R interval, half of that. Um, mm. And, you know, just finishing it out, I don't see any other acute signs of ischemia or anything else concerning. So for me, this gentleman uh, has a normal sinus rhythm with a long QT. Uh, and a guy, young guy, coming with vomiting, my first question would be, what's the K? Very astute, John. The K was unmeasurable. It was so low. It was less than two. And on our POC assays, that's all it tells us. It just tells us that it was less than two. So it was super low. And if they're hypo-K, they're always... Hypomag? That's right. So this guy got potassium. He got magnesium. And what's the big concern with this degree of hypokalemia? Why do we care? Uh, we get concerned that they would devolve into a ventricular dysrhythmia, something like torsades de point. <laughs> I, I think we can textify that a little bit. De, de, de pointy? Torsades de pointy? Torsades de pointies? Okay. That's my best boot impression. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, yeah, so that's what you're really concerned about. I will tell you, this guy had several episodes of bradycardia while he was an inpatient. And what do you think about bradycardia in the setting of a prolonged QT? Worrisome? Not worrisome? Definitely worrisome. So bradycardia in the setting of prolonged QT and hypokalemia uh, makes me even more concerned that this person is going to go into torsades. Uh, bradycardia is, uh, is not ideal in that setting. Tachycardia would actually be protective, um, and we'd be much, much, much more comfortable if this person was tachycardic than bradycardic. That's right. In fact, that's why for some patients with torsade, we will actually overdrive pace. So we'll give them something like isoproteranol or we're transcutaneously or transvenous pace them at a faster rate because it will keep them out of that rhythm. Let's but, be honest, though. If you had a choice between giving a patient isoproteranol and medically overdrive facing them no, or electrically this, overdrive facing them. I know what you're doing. You know what I'm doing. You like electricity. <laughs> We're dropping that transvenous pacer like it's hot. Yes, yes. I, I think that was like 10 years ago, the whole drop it like it's hot thing. It wasn't, wasn't very good. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so what what's happening here with the prolonged QT is it's probably a TU fusion. There's some U waves underlying there, and you can actually see them like over here in lead two. You can see that there's a T wave and then a U wave. Uh, and some those get fused and it kind of creates this real broad appearing T wave like you see there in V3 like we highlighted. Uh, highlighted. And that's it's hard to say exactly, exactly like where the T wave ends and where the U wave begins. But suffice to say, the QT segment is prolonged and it does put this person at, at risk for torsade. And the reason why bradycardia is so worrisome is because the, the QT segment is inversely proportional to the heart rate. So in other words, the slower the heart rate, the longer the QT, and also the slower the heart rate, the more prone to ectopy you are. And what happens with torsades, you get that R on T phenomenon. So there's a depolarization while the rest of the heart is still in that repolarization phase. That's called R on T, like a QRS that happens on top of a T wave, R on T phenomenon. And if that happens, that's what sends someone into that polymorphic VTAC or torsade. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, so one of the questions I think we should always ask ourselves is why is this patient vomiting so much that they've vomited their potassium down to a level below two? Um, in our county population, I think our residents will tell you the most common thing that we see is complications of diabetes, things like DKA, where they end up vomiting so much that they bring their K down that low. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, yes. Another very <laughs> common thing that we feel like we see a lot. Um, but this was a little bit of an interesting case. Uh, when you delved into this guy's history a little bit more, what did we find? Yeah, so kind of when the dust settled, uh, what he disclosed to us is that this guy was a big sniffer. He was really into sniffing. So what is that? What do you think? 
So uh, he sounds like he was enjoying some paint sniffing. Let's make that clear. Yeah. Uh, so no, yeah, he like... wasn't like sniffing his dirty laundry. <laughs> so things like toluene um, toxicity, uh, I think, come into play here. Um, and, and that's what this guy had. He yeah. had toluene toxicity from paint sniffing. That's right. Yeah. So toluene can uh, induce a renal tubular acidosis. Stay with me, John. Oh, gosh. RT RTAs, Don't go off huh? Yet. Yes. And we play a lot of inpatient medicine at our county hospital because patients board there for days. And so it's actually not uncommon for us to check urine electrolytes. I don't want to scare people, but that was probably the worst part of everyone's step one experience, right? So for me, urine electrolytes, RTAs, that was that part in first aid that I completely overlooked and said, this isn't really that high yield. Yeah, you're like, I, I, can, I can miss that question. Yeah, it's okay. I'll, I'll still do focus okay. focus on some other stuff. <laughs> well, let me bring it back to you. There are three types of RTAs. We're not going to go into them, but toluene can produce a type 1 RTA, which is a distal RTA, and it can make someone profoundly hypokalemic like this. So it actually ended up being a pretty cool tox case. Yeah. So this guy ended up getting admitted to our ICU, um, getting his electrolytes repleted, his acidemia improved, uh, was seen by nephrology, again, diagnosed with the type 1 RTA, ended up doing well and left the hospital a couple days later. Okay. Now for our next case. Oh, so yeah, Ben, I let's... think you're supposed to introduce this one. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Uh, so Ben, this is a pre-hospital ECG that we received from some of our HFD colleagues uh, who, are, who are amazing at what they do. And this was from an 81-year-old woman who called uh, with a chief complaint of dizziness. And then what do you see here on the pre-hospital ECG? Well, the first thing I noticed is that it's really bradycardic. And the rate is like in the 20s. If you count the number of QRS complexes, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 times 6 is 24. So, yeah, it's in the 20s. That's not good. And especially in the setting of someone who's complaining of dizziness. I think we have an explanation for her dizziness. And now... That we know the rate's low. Let's look at the rhythm. And I'm, I am seeing some P waves. So P wave here, here. There's probably one buried in here and here and here and here and here. And if you kind of march those out, the P waves can march out pretty regularly. Um, but they seem to have nothing to do with the QRS complexes whatsoever. So this is AV dissociation. It's complete heart block. And... Uh, I can tell you that this is a ventricular escape rhythm because the QRS is wide and also the rate is super low. So ventricular escape rhythms, rhythms that originate in the ventricular system, are usually less than 40. The more distal you go, the slower it will get. So it's probably a very distal pacemaker that has kind of taken over here. She needs a she needs a pacer. She needs electricity. Yeah. Just a quick question, Ben. <laughs> Comparing a junctional escape rhythm, which we talk about a lot, and a ventricular escape rhythm, what's the rate typically for junctional rhythms? Junctional, we usually say it's somewhere around 40, maybe up to 60, um, but usually kind of in that range. And it would be narrow if it were a truly junctional escape rhythm. Yeah, got it. Makes sense. So. I love these pre-hospital ECGs because often they give us, you know, a picture into what's going on in a dynamic sense. So we got a pre-hospital ECG. When they come to us, oftentimes the condition has changed and EMS has potentially even treated something. And when they get to us, things could be drastically different. And it's really helpful to compare what you have in the emergency department versus what you had on the pre-hospital ECG. So when she arrived in the emergency department, she was no longer symptomatic. Okay, so she feels fine in the emergency department, and here's her ECG. Well, that's different. Yeah, what, what, what do you think about this one? Yeah, so if we look at this, this actually looks like a sinus rhythm. Those P waves look to be conducting. Um, looks to be a relatively normal rate. Um, there does seem to be a left axis deviation. Um, when yeah. we look at our intervals, the PR interval Looks to be, I don't know, pretty close, just about 200 milliseconds, so pretty close. Get those calipers out. Yeah, I do keep them on me at all times. Yes. Do you not? Push push your glasses up when you say <laughs> that. So potentially a first-degree heart block, but it's really close. We'd have to measure it a little bit more closely. The QRS does look a little bit wide, um, and there is an RSR prime pattern that we see in V1 that's consistent with the right bundle branch block. Um, and the QT looks normal as well. Um, we talked I, about that. Sorry about that laser pointer right there. I was messing around with something. Someone take that Just laser ignore pointer that. from him. <laughs> it's like the George Costanza trying to <laughs> swat it off of his face. 
<laughs> so uh, we did mention that that left axis deviation. So uh, coupled with the right bundle branch block and that severe left axis deviation, that's likely due to a left anterior fascicular block. So this is at minimum a bifascicular block. Mm -hmm. And if we got those calipers out and measured that PR interval, if it was over 200 milliseconds, we can actually call this a trifascicular block. Um, but that that's really close. So at minimum, a bifascicular block, possibly even a trifascicular block here. Yeah, and I think just knowing that she had intermittent complete heart block, there's almost certainly trifascicular disease. Um, so what's going on with that with a, a trifascicular block is that there's disease of all three fascicles. Wait, wait, there's there's three. There's three. I don't know if you let. There's three. Only three. There's a there's a right, and there's two lefts, an anterior and a posterior. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So what happens with a trifascicular block is that you've got some obvious conduction disease in the uh, the, the infranodal air, uh, you know conduction system, and so that's evidenced by the right bundle branch block. You know that the right bundle is affected, and then there's a left anterior fascicular block because of the left the extreme left axis deviation. So the left anterior fascicle is affected, the right bundle is affected. You know that for sure, and then there's often well if it's a trifascicular block there's a prolonged pr segment also now in a younger patient that's say an athlete uh, we don't really think anything about a first degree block right that's just you know it's just a healthy person we, we're like yeah good on you you got yeah. you got a first yeah. i mean i don't know if you have a first degree av block but De probably not me you I, might. I hope you, i have you, you one. run a lot I, i've I would feel pretty good. I would like. I would promote that. I would probably like tattoo it on my arm or something. First degree AV block. Uh, but no, not in an 81 year old with already conduction disease, meaning right bundle and left anterior fascicle that are blocked. So that prolonged PR in this setting most likely represents disease of that remaining fascicle, the left posterior fascicle, which is the only one that's actually conducting, is probably conducting much slower. And that's where the prolonged PR comes from in this sort of context. Um, and so if you see that, you really got to worry, and especially if someone's presenting with syncope or any sort of pre-syncopal type symptoms, then you really got to worry about intermittent complete heart block, which is exactly what was going on in this patient because we actually captured it with the pre-hospital ECG. Yeah, really, really cool case that we were able to see the pre-hospital ECG and then our ED ECG. Uh, so what, what happened to this lady? Well, she got admitted, obviously, and she ended up getting a permanent pacemaker. As far as I know, she's probably doing really well and going to run the marathon next week. Oh, exciting. <laughs> okay, so this is our, our final case of conference number four. This is a short one. So this is uh, case number 15, 19-year-old male that presented with syncope. What do you think, John? Ooh, the young syncopal patient. I, I will tell you that this patient, let me just fast forward a little bit. This patient ended up getting admitted, and I think I see what they were potentially worried about. I think I, see, I think I see it too. Uh, I'm going to stick with our standardized approach. This way I don't skip anything, though, and perhaps miss something. Good thinking. So this looks to be a sinus rhythm uh, with a normal rate. There does seem to be a touch of a sinus arrhythmia that we see. Uh, between the fourth and fifth beat, that interval isn't exactly the same, but normal in a young person. Um, the axis is normal. Our intervals seem normal. Um, however, when I do look, and, and I don't see any signs of ischemia, when I do look at the morphology of the QRS segment, particularly in V1 and V2, I do see a little bit of abnormalities. We see that RSR prime pattern there. Um, and in a narrow QRS complex, that is potentially a uh, compatible with an incomplete right bundle branch block. But as we move down to V2, we see a few, or maybe just a little bit of an abnormality that is making us question this. So we see that RSR pro, uh, prime pattern again, and we see this sort of saddleback appearance of the ST segment between the R prime and the T wave. That was terrible, I apologize. <laughs> your drawings aren't great, but I appreciate your help. Uh, so we see that sort of saddleback appearance and we typically, uh, you know, when we use that term, we are thinking about Brugada type 2 pattern. Um, and I think that's what the providers or the docs who are taking care of this patient were worried about when they saw the CCG and why they actually admitted the patient. Great. Yeah. And so let me take this opportunity to remind everyone that historically there are three types of Brugada. 
And type one is the most worrisome. That's that coved type that you, you won't miss. The degree of SD elevation is quite a bit. It looks something like that. So I don't think you'd miss that one. Maybe you would, John, but most people wouldn't miss that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. But there's also two other types traditionally. Uh, type two is this saddleback appearing type, and that may be what you're seeing kind of there in V1 and V2. You got the little saddleback uh, looking ST segment. Uh, and then there was a type three also. Type three is no longer a type, which is a good thing because I don't think I could ever pick up on a type three. Just type three is done. You, you can just erase that from your mind if you ever had it in there to begin with. Does not exist. But uh, type two does exist, but you only get diagnosed with Brugada if you have a type one that is inducible. So you get the syndrome if you actually had syncope or you have a family history of a first degree relative of sudden cardiac death then you would definitely be diagnosed with Brugada if you had a type 1 on your ECG or if you had an inducible type 1. So what that means is this a patient with a concerning uh, EKG for type 2 might go to the EP lab and get a sodium channel blocker and see if they could actually induce the type 1 pattern. And if they can, then it's called Brugada. And what do they get? They get an, an uh, implantable cardiac defibrillator. Correct. Uh, but this patient ended up getting admitted, and they were so concerned, consulted cardiology, cardiology got EP involved, and what do you think EP said? I think they said not Brugada. They did, and let's talk a little bit about why that is. Sure. So here is a, a nice example of Brugada type 2. This was taken from ddxof.com, Tom Fadile's love child. Yeah, great guy, super smart. Mm -hmm. uh, has some really great algorithms on there. Highly recommend it. Why don't you just kind of walk us through what you're noticing on this pattern and what exactly it is about this that makes it a type 2 Brugada? Sure. So again, we see this RSR prime pattern. Um, so we note that again here. Um, and the first thing that I want to focus on uh, after we document the RSR prime here <laughs> is the uh, the height of the ST segment here compared to the TP baseline. So for Brugada, that should be at least one millimeter. Um, and now the second part that I really want to talk about is the angle that's coming off of the R prime. So the angle from the R prime to the T wave or the ST segment, um, right there, if we, if we look at that angle, that looks relatively, dare I say, obtuse as opposed to acute. Um, so you're, you're so obtuse. Thank you. I think that's a compliment, actually. That appears to be a relatively obtuse angle. And the more obtuse angles are what we usually find consistent with Brugada type 2 pattern. I'm going to get that right eventually. <laughs> this, this angle right here. Someone get the stylus out of his hands. <laughs> that angle. Um, and if it's we obtuse. can now uh, pull up uh, a blown up version of what our ECG looked like right now. We can. Oh, technology. There she is. Um, so again, we can look, and we do see an element of that ST elevation here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. However, when we look at the angle coming from the R prime into the ST segment, that angle looks significantly more acute than the one we see in our prior example. And I think that is probably why our EP folks ended up not thinking that this was Brugada. That angle is too acute uh, to be the type two Brugada. What you're looking for is an obtuse or wide angle, not so much of a sharp or acute angle, right? Yes, those are the appropriate terms. Okay. Now, there there actually is real criteria for that, but honestly, you're, no one's going to remember that. And um, you can look it up if you really want to get your calipers out and try to figure that out. But you're dr really just looking for an angle, like a wide angle. It's a wide angle, not an acute angle. Okay. Got it. Very good. That was it. Oh, we're done. We're done. That was easy. Okay, well, I guess until next time, folks. Which is going to be for us in about five minutes. Sounds good.